Let's see if anyone figures this out. <laughs> right as I said it, all the names start rolling in. Hi guys! So we missed a Saturday stream. I got in early this morning and I thought, yeah, maybe this evening I can just knock out a, a nice simple little tiny live stream, not some epic um, marathon. Uh, so I want to uh, have a topic for tonight and my topic specifically is going to be about setting up your very first saltwater tank because many of you are thinking about setting up a tank and haven't quite pulled the trigger yet and I thought if I could talk about that then uh, maybe you'll have the courage to set up that tank and uh, have something really pretty in your home too. So my reef is about to go to sleep. Uh, we have some blue time and then it's going to shut down. I've got some fish food melting over here and I've got myself a drink that I'm about to pour and I thought we could just chat for a little bit. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's not Saturday, no, no. It's uh, 10 p.m., just a little bit after 10 on Monday night, and uh, I was out of town for a few days to see family for my birthday. So I went there and had a nice time, and now I'm back. And I'm back to work, and I've already worked today, and I'm tired. <laughs> I'm sure I could use two days sleep, but uh, yeah, hey, I thought this could be fun. So let's see how we do tonight. So. Let's just jump into the actual topic itself. Uh, there's no like news things to share with you that I can think of. So when you are thinking about starting any type of aquarium in your home, the very first thing you need is a spot. Where are you gonna put it? Where's the best place in the room? Uh, what kind of climate controls are you dealing with? You know, will the room get hot? Will the room get cold? Is it in direct sunlight? Uh, is it gonna reflect off the television and you can't see your favorite TV shows? I mean, these are some things that come in into play, as well as could a pet interfere with it or knock it down? Could a child pull it down? You know, is it child safe? See, these are just kind of things you want to kind of think through before you do a thing, because that way you can anticipate what could go wrong and plan accordingly to protect everyone, including the livestock. Now, if you live in a California zone, for example, you have to also contend with earthquakes. So you need to make sure that your tank will stay secure when the world is rocking. And that is a, a very important thing to know. Uh, so let me just touch on that really quickly. Uh, if you have children or pets or earthquakes that could potentially knock a tank over, you can tether the stand itself to the wall with some eye grommets. You would put those screw right into the stud of the wall and then you'd put some kind of uh, something on the, on the back side of the stand, maybe something similar with bolts. And then you can run a small cable and crimp it together. And just as a safety wire, just to kind of help keep it in place if someone starts pulling or uh, if the house starts shaking. You know, so, I mean, can the tank jump off the stand? Yes, I mean, whole ceilings cave in and, col and stairs collapse. So, I mean, you know, if it's that situation, tank is probably the least of your worries. But for the most part, we just want to kind of make sure everything's stable and secure. We want to make sure, that we want to make sure that the floor is strong enough to hold the weight of the aquarium. And kind of a, a thing that I worry about as well is when you walk past the aquarium, does it bounce? You know, is the floor stable or does it have some give? So one of the things that you may see people talk about when trying to set up an aquarium in their home is, can I put it on the second floor? Can I put it on the third floor? And a lot of times people will say, well, which way are your joists running? Are they running horizontal, uh, uh, parallel, or are they running perpendicular? So ideally, you want this, the joists under the floor to be running perpendicular to the wall. So your wall, you are the wall, and then all the joists are going towards you. And then we set the tank on it. It's sitting on multiple joists in theory, depending how long this tank is, and spreading out the weight across a bunch. If it is parallel with the room going sideways, there's a chance you put the tank right on top of one joist and it could rock back and forth. So we don't want that to happen. Now let's just pretend you're going to set up a small tank. Uh, let's say it's a bio cube, came with its own stand, or a Red Sea, uh, some kind of a small cube that's 30, 40 gallons. You're not going to have to kill yourself on decision making here, and you're, you're gonna have to, you don't have to really panic about it. But still, you want to make sure it's in a good spot you want to consider that there's going to be water <laughs> around and in this tank at all times, which involves water changes, cleanings, uh, removing gear. You know, is it going to mess up the floor? 
And is there anything you can do to protect your floor? And some people think, well, I have beautiful hardwood floors. Maybe I can put a patch of carpet down or some kind of padding, put the stand on top of that, put the tank on top of that. But then what happens is every time you drip or spill or anything, it goes under that mat or that carpet and just ruins the wood. So I would basically say don't think of how you can preserve the wood. Just be super careful not to spill. And if and when it is time to move the tank, you may have to fix that area of the floor. So it's just part of the hobby. Just like if you have beautiful hardwood floors and you got a big dog with, with claws, you know, with the, their, their toenails, it could gouge the floor. Eventually, if you want to sell the house, you got to fix the floor. It's the same principle. Now, the other important thing is now that you've found the spot you like and the size tank you might like to have, you also are going to want to know if there's electricity in that area that would be sufficient to support the aquarium. So if you have a uh, small tank, you know, usually two circuits is plenty, but it's better than one circuit. So if you have a spot in your home and it's got one circuit right now that kind of shares with the rest of the living room and your surround sound and your popcorn making machine because you want it to feel like a movie theater, there's a chance when you're popping the popcorn that the breaker will trip because the tank pulls more juice than you anticipated. So you want to make sure there's enough uh, electricity being supplied to the area where the tank will be. And that would be something that would be great to do before the tank is in place, is to get an electrician to add one more circuit. I, I know some people might say, well, just put a bigger breaker in the wall, you know, instead of a 15 amp, make it a 20. If the wiring of the house supports it, you know, if the wiring is rated for 20 amps, yeah, that's a, a way to jump up another five. But the reason I like two circuit breakers going to a single aquarium is if one trips, the other's still going. And if you've divided your equipment across both equally, some pumps are off, but some are still on. You know, uh, maybe one heater is off, but the other heater is on, that kind of thing. So you could kind of plan that way to... Uh, avoid a disaster in the event of, uh, you know, a, a nuisance trip. Of course, if it's a major reason for it to trip, then you need to figure out what equipment failed you and correct it immediately. You can't just keep resetting the breaker. That's a terrible method. So please don't do that. Uh, when you're choosing the tank you want, you're going to want to look up reviews to decide what you're going to buy. But just kind of know up front, the cheapest part of this whole project is the glass box. And I know they can be expensive, but that's really just a drop in the bucket compared to everything else you're going to spend money on. And it's going to, you're going to, your eyes are going to kind of get wider as you get more deeper into this. So up front, I just tell everyone, if you're going to set up a reef tank with really good, you know, with good quality gear that you can trust and will last you for years, you're looking at about $47 a gallon. And that's before you add any kind of livestock. That's all the equipment, the tank, the stand, the lighting, the skimmer, the sump, return pump, in-tank flow, um, uh, test kits, because you got to test your water, uh, salt mix, the barrel you mix the salt in, maybe a small power head and heater for that. If you're going to be wise and use a quarantine tank, you've got to spend another $50, $75 on a little quarantine tank. That's like a 10 or 20 gallon with its own hang on back filter, uh, its own thermometer, its own uh, small heater. So, I mean, money gets spent. And then eventually, you're ready to add the water to the tank. <laughs> and that is when you, um, when you start spending more money <laughs> beyond the $47 a gallon. But the $47 number may seem like a weird arbitrary number, but now, I don't know, I guess a decade ago, I decided to figure out what exactly does it cost to set up a tank in this day and age. It's 10 years later. Uh, I haven't seen prices come down, so I'm going to say we're still pretty close to that number. But that's pretty realistic. So, you know, just it, if you know up front what kind of money you're going to spend, you can make a better decision how much of a tank you want to buy. So you might say, you know what, $47 a gallon, maybe I'll just set up a 20 gallon and be happy. And there's nothing wrong with that. My very first tank, I was 11 years old, was a 20 gallon long, and it probably had a canister filter, but I don't even remember that. I, I probably had an in-tank filtration of some kind, like an undergravel filter, some substrate, maybe a, one of the, uh, what do they call it, silent giant air pumps, and I didn't care about fish. All I wanted was invertebrates, because when I was a kid, there was a rule of one inch of fish per gallon 
is the most you can put in your tank. So if I have a 20 gallon tank and I have 20 total inches of fish and I, I didn't like being limited. <laughs> so I said, how many invertebrates can I put? And they said, all that you can cram in there. And I was like, now we're talking. So I had tons of hermit crabs. I had coral banded shrimp. I had, uh, I, I'm pretty sure I had an arrow crab, feather dusters. Um, I don't even know. That's pretty much the top of my list. Maybe there was some kind of peppermint shrimp or, or a cleaner shrimp maybe because they're so pretty. Uh, so I just had this tank full of invertebrates. And when I come home from school, I could look in my tank and I really loved it. And you know, it, it wasn't very expensive to run and I had to do those water changes. So that uh, was my choice as a tiny child. And I was also helping my father with his own aquariums. He had a, a hex tank with uh, some kind of a sea bay anemone, uh, three spotted damselfish, a long nose uh, butterfly, an octopus was in there. We had to put a rock on top of the lid so the octopus would not escape. There was, what else was in that tank? Eh, probably Hawaiian feather dusters again. And then my dad had a huge predator tank in his bedroom that had a lionfish, a grouper, and something else. There was three fish in there. And I remember my job as a kid was to put the net between my father and the lionfish when he had to clean the tank. And when the lionfish swam past the net, I got in trouble. <laughs> and uh, it happened a few times. So. Oh, this is the end of the bottle. Man, this is going to be a quick live stream. So I love Crown Royal Reserve. I haven't bought one in forever, but I am now ready for a new bottle. But the reason I like Crown Royal Reserve, or Cast 16, is because you don't have to use ice with it. It's just perfect, like you see in all the movies when they pull something out of their desk drawer and they just have a sip. Yum. All right. Now... Once you've got the stand in place where the aquarium's gonna go, whatever you've chosen to use. If you choose furniture, like some kind of a dresser, because it's a small tank, that's acceptable. But just realize there's a possibility anything underneath could get wet. And maybe you won't have room for filtration to hide underneath because it's a bunch of drawers or there's shelves inside. You know, you know, what if you say, hey, I wanna add a sump to this aquarium? You may not be able to do it. So you wanna think ahead, am I gonna put a, a sump underneath and put a protein skimmer in there and a return pump and I'm gonna have dosing pumps, you know. These are all the things you wanna put inside a stand. So pick the right stand. And then you want it to be level. And level is so important. And I can't overemphasize it enough. Your tank needs to be level all the way across. If you look behind me right now, you can see the water line right there. And there's like a black line that's going the full length of the tank and you can see that it's pretty much the exact same size of black line all the way across. And you want your tank to be 100% level. Now one of the things that concerns me is when people will take like a short little six inch level and put it on their six foot long tank. Or, or they'll have a two foot level and they put it on a six foot long tank. You really need a six foot level for a six foot tank so that you are literally checking the tank's length. And then of course the front to back of your tank, if it's 24 inches, a two foot level would be wise. But to put a little level in the middle of a big tank is not accurate for what we do. So it's very important that you um, get the right size level. And uh, it is literally something you'll use once in your life. You know, <laughs> you'll level the tank and then you're basically done unless you expect your house foundation to shift and there's changes and you have to readjust. But let's just assume that you're going to do it once. I hate to even say this because I don't like this type of mentality, but if you bought one from Home Depot and all you did was put it on top of a dry aquarium and you didn't do anything else to it, it didn't get wet, ding, drop, damaged, in theory it could be returned. You know, but uh, I normally would not do that myself. I'm just saying, you know, don't cheap out. Maybe borrow one from a friend who's a carpenter. You know, have him come over and help you level it. Now, how do you level a tank? Uh, there's something to keep in mind. If you're putting your tank on a stand on carpet, carpet usually is held to the wall with tack strips. And what that is is a strip of wood that has a bunch of these teeth sticking up and they hammer it down, you know, they hammer nails through this board with the teeth sticking up straight into the concrete. And then the carpet layer comes in and he stretches the carpet and hooks it on all those little teeth that are sticking up. And when you try to put an aquarium near the wall, 
there's a good chance the stand is sitting on top of the tack strip itself. So what that, that is doing is leaning the tank forward slightly, which you want to overcome by leveling up, by bringing the front of the tank up to push the tank back to level. So I hope that made sense. It's gonna be leaning forward if there's something higher in the back, which in the case of carpeting, the tack strip could be lifting the tank. So you'll want to go ahead and put shims in the front of the tank. You'll tap them in with a hammer. You watch the level. And when it's completely level, great. Then when you're happy, you can take a chisel and you can put it in right in front of the cabinet on, on top of that shim that's sticking out. And you can hit the, hit the top of the chisel with your hammer to score that shim. And then you'll put the chisel under the shim and pry it up and it basically snaps it because you didn't cut through. See, the fear is you're hitting a chisel downward. You don't want to puncture either carpeting or if you have hardwood floors, you don't want to damage the floors. So by scoring that shim in the proper position and then prying it up, it'll snap. And then the piece that you just broke off, you can put it back against the shim and take a hammer and tap it in once or twice, kind of nudging it just a little bit more so it's out of sight. And then throw away the piece that was sticking out too far and toss it, it's done. But that's a trick that we did when I did, uh, I used to do carpentry inside homes and shimming up things was very important. Now, your tank is level, you put in your sand, you put in, and people are gonna say, do I need sand? Yes, you need sand. And people say, you don't need sand, it's evil. I love sand, it's in the ocean. If you go anywhere and swim, you're going to see sand. It's very normal. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I even shoot footage of just areas of sand going through all the rock with all the corals to prove there's sand in the ocean. It's not a bare bottom glass aquarium. I just hate that look. So I, I do recommend sand. And you can choose if you want one inch, if you want half an inch, if you want four inches, that's up to you. But I love the look of sand. It's a good place for your uh, bacteria to breed and live within your bio, uh, what am I thinking of? The, all the bugs, the, the worms, all that stuff lives in the upper half inch of sand. And so having a sand bed for them to live in and breed in is beneficial for consuming waste that decays in the tank. So you've put in sand, you add some rock, you fill it up with water, then you check it with a level one more time to make sure nothing changed. Uh, does it need to be shimmed a little bit more or is it still level? Because now you've got all the weight in the water in there. It's not going to keep changing daily. It's you know, now's the time, just double check your numbers. If everything looks nice and perfect in all directions, now you're done leveling it and you can start to do other things like start a cycle. So I hope that that will kind of help you with the first part. Uh, the next part is gonna be what equipment you're gonna put in the tank and what you're gonna use initially in case you're trying to kind of follow a budget. You don't wanna spend all your money up front on every single piece. You've got the tank on the stand, it's level, it's got water in it, it's got sand and rock, but where's the salt? So you see, in my case, I would have mixed the water with salt and then poured it in the tank. Some people like to add the salt to the aquarium after it's in, but I just find that's a mess. So I really do prefer to pre-mix it in a barrel and pump that in. So I would do that before I love, you know, and then double check the level of the tank. Uh, rather than just using water. I've never, I never do tap water tests with brand new aquariums, I just assume that the tank is gonna hold water since they, it's brand new. And if you feel the need to use tap water first, you can. You don't have to do anything special. Of course, you wanna wipe it all down, that's fine too. But uh, it's, it's glass, silicone, you're, you're good to go. So you don't have to worry about any kind of weird chemicals in your brand new aquarium to, to fear. You, don't, you are not forced to like wipe it down with white vinegar and water or something like that. But if you see something that you don't like, obviously a sponge can just sponge it out. And sponges is another thing. If you go anywhere to buy a sponge, almost every package you pick up says on the backside, not for aquarium use. But that doesn't mean you can't use it in an aquarium. I think they just don't want to get sued. So if you find a sponge, I prefer something that's just uh, cellulose, normal, and it doesn't have any kind of uh, cleaning chemical in it. So like, here's an example of a sponge that I use. So this one here, it's just a regular, like you'd use in a kitchen. And when I buy them, I buy like six. And I put them in the Ziploc bag so that it doesn't, usually it's a little, this one feels a little dry, but I usually keep them in a the Ziploc bag so that they don't dry out and turn to stone. And that way, if I need a nice clean sponge, I got a brand new one ready to go. And you can rinse that in some vinegar and water, and uh, then it's ready to use. And whenever I'm done with the sponge, 
I will rinse it in the sink under tap water and then I just let it, you know, I throw it in a bucket for, you know, future needs. But don't use any kind of a sponge that has a, a scrubby on it because there's a chance you'll scratch the glass with a scrubby, believe it or not. Um, and you don't want any kind of a chemical in it, like an anti-mold uh, ingredient or if there's some kind of soap injected in it. None of that. Uh, another type of sponge that hobbyists like to use is called the Magic Eraser. And make sure you get the Magic Eraser original. You don't want the one that's enhanced. Get the original one. And then every time I tell people this, someone chimes in, you can get them cheaper on Amazon for a different name. That's true, you can. But you can find Magic Eraser everywhere, so go buy yourself a couple. They'll last you a long time. And those are really good to use on acrylic tanks if your tank is not glass. But it works on glass just as well. Um, okay, so we've got our tank set up with salt water. Now it's time to... We're going to need test kits. We're going to need flow. We're going to need something to start the cycle. And we're going to need a way to measure the water quality. Uh, we're going to need somehow to keep the temperature of the tank stable. So the things that we're going to be needing at this point would be a series of test kits. And the master saltwater test kit is what everyone tends to buy at the fish store, which is going to measure for uh, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, and I'm sure there's a fourth bottle in there. I don't know. It might be water hardness, which that's not really how we measure. So it's kind of a, I mean, it's fine for the cycle, but it's kind of a, I'd say a one month use. After that, you're done with it. You're not going to use it. Oh, it, has, it probably has pH in it. So you're not going to use it after that. It's just something you use in the first month. Uh, if you don't want to buy the master test kit, you can buy the individual tests. You need ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate. And you're going to need a way to measure salinity. And I actually recommend a refractometer. I would just, you know, that's part of that $47 a gallon price I was talking about. That should include a nice uh, refractometer that you can look in and you hold it up to the light and you look through and with a few drops of your water on there and you measure, is it 1.026 or is it 1.009, you know, and you, you have to keep adding salt till it's correct. So you're up to that 1.026. And that number is specific gravity. Another way of measuring it is going to be with one of those glass hydrometers that bobs up and down and wherever it stops at the meniscus on the water line of this device. You can then see what the specific gravity is. It might be 1.024, it might be 1.023, but we're trying to aim for 1.026 for our reef tanks. Uh, another method people use that I don't recommend, but a lot of you guys have, because I remember kind of making fun of it on one video once, and boy, everyone jumped down my throat on that one, is they like the kind where you dip the device inside the water, it's a hydrometer, and then this little needle bumps up and down. And those things are dirt cheap and they're unreliable and I just don't recommend them to anyone. I say get a refractometer from the very beginning. Get some 35 PPT calibration solution. You can find all these things on Amazon. You can find it at your fish store. Um, I sell the 35 PPT solution in my shop. If you want to buy it from me, that's fine. It's a good way to calibrate uh, any device you're using to measure salinity to make sure it's accurate. And you're going to need a heater for the tank and when I recommend heaters for anyone. I always say the your total wattage is three watts per gallon. So if you have a 20 gallon tank you need 60 watts of heat and I recommend that you spread that across two heaters. So if you, you know, like I said, if you need 60 watts of heat you're going to want two 30 watt heaters. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that if you have a single 60 watt heater that sticks in the on position it has enough wattage, three watts per gallon, to just warm up the tank and cook it and cook it and cook it until things start dying and that's usually when you notice and it's too late. So I would not recommend a single heater, I would recommend two heaters that are half the strength. Combined they have enough juice to keep the tank at 3 watts per gallon and then you know they cycle off and if one sticks on it doesn't have enough amperage or watts to cook your water. It's just kind of warming it up and every time you look the light is on and hopefully at some point you say oh that thing hasn't turned off in days. I need to investigate and see if it needs to be replaced if there's something defective. You know, why is it still on? That makes no sense. Also, on heaters, I always tell people never, ever, ever believe the numbers on the top of the knob when you're dialing it. You know, like there's a little arrow on the top and it, you're supposed to point it to like 76 degrees. So you put it at 76 and your tank is really 80. 
or it's 72. <laughs> I never believe the number on the dial. I always use a glass thermometer, which are $3 a piece. You can just stick one in the tank, it'll float on the surface. And within five minutes, it tells you the temperature. And you would want to adjust your heater. The, you have to dial in the heater, just like you're dialing the knob of your, you know, when you're taking a shower, you want warm water. You don't want too hot, you don't want too cold, so you dial it in. You're doing the same thing with your heater. You'll be dialing that in to make it match 76 degrees on your your uh, glass thermometer or 78, whatever number is you're aiming for. I like 78 to 80 degrees daily. Um, others want to have it 77 to 77.5. And you know something in the 76 to 80 range is very safe. Anything over 80, it starts getting into dangerous. And if the tank gets over 85, the oxygen levels drop and your fish start gasping. So we definitely don't want to go anywhere near 85. Uh, so you want to take your heater, you want to submerge in the water and plug it in. And it always has to be plugged in underwater. Please never, ever, ever take out a heater leaving, leaving it plugged in because it'll shatter. And when the heater is in the water, plug it in. Now it's turning on and you'll turn the knob and you'll see a light turn on and off based on how you turn the knob on the top. And you're going to keep turning it back and forth. The light flickers on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And it's finally like right at that spot. You know, that's the precise spot that would be the set point not whatever it says on the knob that's my point and ideally it would be nice if your tank was already at 76 degrees when you did this because now you know your heater is set to 76 but if your tank is let's say 72 and you've dialed it in exactly right to where the light comes on and off really quickly and it's, you found that sweet spot to where it's not on right now but it's ready to kick on in a hair right then you can say well my tank is four degrees too cold you can turn the knob and look and see the graduations to set it four degrees warmer. And then of course, in, I don't know, a couple of hours, check on your tank and see if you're at your number. And if you're at your number, did the heater turn off again? Or is it still on? You know, that's what I'm saying. We wanna get that just right. And once it's set up, it's done. I mean, you're not gonna have to keep messing with it. Whenever you do a water change, make sure the heater is unplugged because you don't want it to uh, be exposed to air and shatter. So, you know, don't forget that. That's really important. So we've got the tank set up, we've got the test kits, we've made our salinity correct, we've got the temperature correct. Do we need lights yet? Absolutely not. You do not need lights yet. As a matter of fact, you don't need lights for the first month. So if you're holding off, you don't have enough money for everything, don't buy the lights yet. Uh, you can wait for that for another solid month because what we need to do now is cycle the tank. I don't think I've left anything out. If I did, I will, I will update this you know, further in the conversation. But once your uh, tank is established and running, oh, we didn't talk about flow. So we need some kind of power head in the tank. And it could be a gyre, it could be a wave, it could be a vortex, it could be a J-Bow, you know, it could be a maxi jet. Just whatever fits your aquarium that creates flow in the tank so that the livestock is getting good movement of water. It's very, very important for a number of reasons. One of them is oxygen exchange. The gas exchange in your tank is critical and the fish only live when everything's right and with a lack of flow it's very dangerous to them because they have a hard time breathing and you want to make sure that the surface of your tank is rippling you can see that right there at the top of my water that's that's rippling and you want your water to look like that it should not look still like the top of a lake or like a pond we want movement this is ocean we're recreating so don't fear the ripples on the top that's a good thing so we've got power heads in there. We've got it heated. It's the right salinity. It's the right temperature. So now it's time to start the cycle. And this one is kind of one of those things that people have different approaches. Uh, one person actually was pretty adamant that he did not like my method of starting the cycle, which is just to take a deli shrimp, you know, a, sh a raw shrimp from the deli at the supermarket and throw it in the tank and let it rot for three days and then throw it away. And that's all you got to do. And boom, your cycle has started. Others would rather pour pure ammonia into the tank or pee in the tank or buy some kind of a bottled item and pour that in to create the cycle. I have always used the shrimp method. Before the shrimp method, I used to put in a damsel. That's what you did back in the day. You'd put in a damsel. It would swim around in this brand new tank that had zero bacteria. And as the 
fish would swim around, of course, we would feed it, it would pee and poop in the water, and we would start to create a cycle, and the fish had to live through the cycle. And at some point in my education about aquariums, it was basically said that was unethical. Uh, it was inhumane to the fish. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense. It, it is kind of rough. Even if it's a hardy fish that can tolerate it, doesn't really mean it's the right thing to do. So instead, using a raw shrimp from the supermarket deli, the ready on ice, you're not murdering more shrimp in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> it, you're just asking for one that's ready in the rack and say, just give me one to go. It'll cost you a dollar and uh, you want the whole shrimp, the head, the tail, the whole beast. And just, you know, you can rinse it off if you want. Just toss it in the tank and let it lie there on the sand and let it rot and decompose. And it's going to get disgusting and after three days. And after that, it's pretty much ready to just be removed from the tank. And you can use some tongs, remove it. It's going to smell terrible. Throw it away or flush it. And uh, now the ammonia cycle has begun. And you got to wait for the ammonia to rise and fall. And that could take 14 days, maybe even a little bit longer. And then when the ammonia drops, the nitrite will shoot up. And it'll go up really high, really fast. And then within a matter of like two, three days, it comes down. And then the nitrates shoot up. And they uh, stay up for a little while, and then they come down. So during that whole period, why would you need lights? All we're doing is cycling the tank. You're, it's just sitting there simmering, <laughs> idling. And so that whole process just happens. And what I do like to recommend to a brand new hobbyist as they're learning the chemistry of, of aquariums is use your test kits and measure the ammonia, the nitrite, and the nitrate every single day and, on a, and use either some kind of thing on your phone or just use some graph paper and actually graph and show it going up, 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 and then coming down. It's a, actually a really cool learning for yourself, you know, to see how the cycle happens on paper so I would recommend doing that every day, test all three and mark the results on your thing. And then the next, you know, on your, your notepad or whatever it is, you're using your graph paper. And then the next day you do it again and the next day, and you keep doing this for about 21 days. And like I said, after about three weeks, your cycle should be completed and it's ready for the first fish. And that'll be exciting. And even when you get your first, your first fish, you don't need the light quite yet. But if you have decided now I'm ready to buy my light, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people like to use LED uh, lighting. There's lots of them on the market, uh, all, all different price ranges from, you know, $800 for a fixture down to $100. So you're going to have to base your choice of the light you buy on what kind of livestock you're going to keep. If you're just planning to have some fish, weak lighting is fine. If you were going to have fish and corals, you're going to need more intense lighting. And so it'd be really good to read up on different light fixtures, but then also read what other hobbyists are using. You know, rather than just following some reviews on Amazon, for example, if you see someone has a nice tank, say, what light are you using? Um, which model is that? You know, how tall is your tank? And compare their tank to your tank. Make sure things match, you know? And that way you can kind of get a, a good feel for what's a good choice. Or it, you can kind of ask people in Club Miller's Reef, what do you guys recommend? What, I'm thinking about buying this. Is it a good choice or is it not? So if you're not a member of our club yet, just go to facebook.com slash groups slash Milo's Reef. And uh, once I approve you, you'll be able to interact with other members of the club. And we just talk and answer questions all the time. And I was only gone a few days, and it shows 81 people are waiting to join right now. So I need to add them tomorrow. But you guys are welcome to join. Now I'm going to take a quick break to feed my fish. So let me turn that off so you guys can watch the screen. And uh, we'll put some food in the tank. Oh, I didn't bring my little pipette over here. All right, I have to unplug the mic for a second. I tried to remember everything. So the first thing I'm gonna do is turn off my return pump and let the water settle. And I've got a bunch of frozen food here that's been thawing behind me for the last 30 minutes. It's a mixture of Rod's food and some mysis and uh, some PE mysis. And I don't know what else, uh, fish eggs. I did spend today cleaning the glass on both tanks and that took a long time. All the fish are in the back because normally I feed from behind. They're expecting me to be over there. But this wire is not that long. I 
Alrighty, everyone's getting a bite. And then we'll give the last of it to the clownfish. <laughs> Dory is being super skittish today. She's like, what are you doing? You've been cleaning the glass for way too long. So... That is basically how you start your first tank. Now, all the next parts of adding corals and adding fish and choosing which livestock is appropriate and uh, what kind of things you'll have to dose, that's a whole other topic. And there's so many live streams on this channel that talk about each of those individual things that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into that for another you know, 30 minutes or so. But that's just to get started. And I hope that, that kind of answers some questions in your mind, uh, gets you over that hump, gets you to go buy that tank and set one up in your house and start enjoying it now instead of thinking, well, someday I'm gonna do it. Just do it, just have a good time. So now I am going to scroll way, way back and see what I missed here in all the comments. And what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna answer questions for a little while. And I think we're, I don't know, I'm gonna do my best. I really don't want to stay on long tonight. So we'll probably go like 20, 30 minutes and then we're just gonna stop. So just so you have a heads up. So I see Mike Howison is on here. Again, I'm scrolling back to the beginning. Maybe by now people have dropped off. <laughs> but uh, there's 200 people in here right now. Uh, Mike said, 10 p.m.? Like, yeah, well, I had work to do. Let's see. Let's see. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. DML says, I love this channel. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. I put a lot of effort into it. And I meet people everywhere all the time, and I love my conversations. I don't care who they are. As far as I'm concerned, every one of them is a potential person that's going to have an aquarium one day. Let's see. Ah, thank you, Mitch. I appreciate that. I, uh, yeah, my birthday was last week. And I am still 39 years old. <laughs> That's my ongoing joke. I'm going to stick with that for as long as I humanly can last. I don't know. Maybe I can die 39. Wouldn't that be great? You know, why does reality have to be real? Why, why can't I have one little thing that I lie about? Let's see. Um, let's put this on the screen. Dustin says, I bought my first fish tank a year ago. I learned many lessons such as doing research before buying fish. An example, I bought a trigger fish who ate three skunk cleaner shrimp at $35 each. That was an expensive mistake. Yes, see, that's the whole compatibility of what livestock can go with other livestock. And there are times when you actually did the homework and you actually knew what you could put in your tank and in theory it should be fine, but when you introduce that brand new pepperant shrimp or a cleaner shrimp, the fish might think it's dinner time and just go right for it instantly as soon as it hits the water. So sometimes when you're introducing something new to your tank that in theory should be safe to add, you might want to have it in your hand and lower it into the tank and kind of put your hand over the top as it goes onto the rock work to make sure it's kind of safe from the other fish. Or another trick I like to use when I'm doing something that maybe has a potential of confusion, I would feed the tank so all the fish are busy eating and sneak in the new guy. So that's something else that might work for you. Are we supposed to have weather? Because I thought I heard thunder a second ago and then light was flashing outside my window. Let's see, hang on. Yeah, we got storms coming, 80% chance of storm. All right, well, we definitely don't wanna go long. What if we lose power? Alrighty. Dritz Killa85 says, I just started my second tank, a 90 gallon, and I never got a good cycle. Okay, so if the cycle doesn't really happen, you know, it seems like eh, it went up a little bit, like ammonia went up to like 2 ppm and then dropped. It doesn't necessarily mean the tank won't be able to handle livestock, but I really prefer a good solid cycle. There's nothing wrong with cycling it again to kind of get it going. And sometimes with some people, the cycle might take a lot longer to complete. 
and like, man, I've been waiting six weeks. It's still cycling. What is going on? That just sometimes happens. I, I can't really put my finger on why that happens, but it is something to keep in mind. But if the tank has a light cycle and you add livestock, there's a good chance there's not enough bacteria to handle the bio load of the livestock you're introducing. So I would, at the very least, if you're like, well, I'm not going to do any more cycling. I've waited long enough. I want to put stuff in. Just go gradually. Add one new fish, you know, and, and focus on, I don't know, invertebrates for a little bit and let the tank kind of adjust to that for four to six weeks before you get the next fish. Don't go nuts like a like an episode of Tanked and put in 47 fish thinking that'll make it cycle faster. It will not. <laughs> that won't help in your battle. So I don't recommend that. Uh, Jake says, I'm remodeling my living room where my 90 gallon is. Any thoughts on the best flooring? Currently the tank is on Pergo and the wife wants tile. Tile's great. And you have another choice. You could put tile everywhere except where the tank is going to sit and let it drop in and then tile up to the edges or you can put tile underneath the entire thing but as you know tile are slightly uneven and it will affect the leveling of the tank you may have to do some interesting things underneath the stand to get it completely rock solid where it doesn't move it doesn't rock it doesn't teeter totter you know you want all four corners to be solid and the tank to be level but uh you could, I mean, if the floors had time to really cure, you could potentially put a, a tank on there. And a 90 gallon, 90, 90, you're probably looking at a total of around 15, 1600 pounds in that spot. Uh, if the tile just went in, there's a good chance it'll settle and it'll mush into the mortar. So let it have time to cure however long that is. And then once it's completely dry and, and you know it's been sealed, you want to make sure you seal the grout lines with a sealer. So when water spills, it doesn't soak in and discolor the grout. Uh, keep that in mind. And you know what? I didn't mention this earlier, but I talked about you know being careful not to get your floor wet. Always have towels handy. Uh, one of my friends was a towel hoarder and went to garage sale after garage sale every Saturday, buying up anyone that had a you know buying any towels that people had for sale because he was going to use them for the aquarium. They didn't have to look good and they didn't have to match. He just needed a thousand of them. And so he had a lot of towels. And always have, you know, if you have like a big plush, like terry cloth towel, uh, you know, almost like the size of a beach towel, you can basically throw it right around the tank where you're working and anything can drip on it. And then when you're done, you just pick up the whole thing and the floor looks perfect. And you don't have to even think about mopping. <laughs> Mr. Reef Buster says, what's up with these secret live shows? Shh, don't tell anyone. Uh, Mina, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Can you do a cycle video in continuation to this? Actually, I have a video on this channel, an actual video, not a live stream, talking about how to cycle a tank, and it talks about the shrimp process, and it shows how I did it and what it looked like. So I would watch that. And that video is probably made about three years ago if you're scrolling back through time. But I think if you just type in the word cycle on the search of Mila's Reef, you know, the, the YouTube channel, you should find it like that. Um, well, Dial, thank you very much for the happy birthday. Appreciate that. Let's see. Dave says, is it worth buying my dream tank even if it's second hand? like a Reef Savvy or a Miracles tank that is used. I just don't know if it's worth paying that high amount of money for a used custom tank. Well, when you're buying one of those high dollar tanks, you're buying it for the brand as well as for the longevity of it, that it should last you a good long time versus a cheaper tank uh, that's maybe not made as well built. So is it worth it? 
The only reason it would be worth it to me is if it looked great and didn't have any scratches. And so you have to decide for yourself when you're buying a used tank, what condition is it in? How, what does it look like? What does the silicone look like? What, does it have your bracing? Are we talking about another rimless tank? I, I actually do not like rimless tanks. <laughs> I pr much prefer tanks that have the rim on the, the inside edge, which is called Euro bracing. And it not only keeps all the water inside the tank, it also helps to keep the tank's shape so that you don't have the corners letting go in theory. So, I mean, I've had a couple of tanks leak even though I had Euro bracing, so it's not a guarantee, but I just feel like it's a stronger tank. So I prefer that. But uh, yeah, you want to look at the tank itself. And if it looks like it's a, a good safe bet and you like what you're seeing, then it really comes up to if you think it's worth spending the money or not. Rogue says, you got to have a cigar with that crown. I don't smoke. Reef and Dive says, I entered into a discussion related to the use of ceramic media. I have quite a few times got to the point it just starts raising nitrate, even cleaning, the, even when you clean them. So removing them causes the nitrate to drop. What are your thoughts? Well, I tried a type of ceramic brick, one brand, and it was supposed to bring my nitrates down and it didn't do anything. And I tried everything I was told to do for a total of eight months. And all it did was having that inside the system of my tank made my refugium almost completely die. All the plants that I had grown shrunk down to about 10%. And I removed that thing and said, I give up. It doesn't do what they said it could do for me. And uh, the macroalgae grew back. <laughs> so it really hated that ceramic media. But uh, I saw when I was in Dubai, every tank I looked at in every single person's system had ceramic media in it. So it's becoming a more and more popular thing. I watched a, a, a thread recently where a guy had ceramic media inside his frag tank and he had no live rock. It was just like he had ceramic media. And I think he treated for like cyano or something. And something bad happened. I don't remember all the details, but I just kept saying there's no live rock. All you had was this ceramic media, these balls sitting in a overflow box or down in the sump or wherever I saw them and I thought you know if you're going to treat a tank for a problem kind of needs to be set up I mean uh I don't know it's it's an opinion piece right <laughs> I just felt like it wasn't set up like a reef tank it was a frag tank with this weird filtration and so when he used the chemical he used to treat the problem that it was that it you know and I'm sorry I don't remember all the details I just read it thought it was weird and kept going I, I didn't memorize it I didn't think I'd be talking about it one day but it was just, it wasn't a normal setup. And so when he did what he did, it didn't work out. And then of course he wanted to blame the product. <laughs> and I was thinking, if you had 80 pounds of live rock in that tank, this whole conversation would be completely different. But it was just lots of frag racks with frags. And basically what happened is he lost a lot of coral and he was blaming the chemical. And I feel like it did something weird with that massive surface area that you always hear about with ceramic media. Um, <laughs> someone was talking about my comment about the level. Home Depot's a big corporation. Don't do it with Ace Hardware because <laughs> it's a small business. Yeah. I mean, I would buy it and just keep it. That's just how I am. I, I don't want, or if you can rent it, you can rent a huge level. There are different places that have tools. Uh, there's like specific tool rental places. Harbor Freight sells things dirt cheap. Uh, but, you know, if you can't buy it outright, maybe you can rent it or, like I said, borrow it from another woodworker that you're friends with. <laughs> okay, I don't know if the moderators banned this person yet or not, but that's hilarious. Amy says, oh my God, this is taking so long. Can you hurry up and take a fish out so we can look at it closely? 
I, I don't do that. You're on the wrong channel. <laughs> but thanks for the laugh. That was funny. And I had to share it with everyone so they could laugh too. That is funny. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, Frank says, when I set up a tank, I always set it up four inches from the wall and I put a sheet of acrylic behind to protect the wall from any kind of salt damage. Brilliant, definitely a, a valuable uh, lesson that we can all benefit from. In my situation, I've got the, uh, the anemone cube against a sheetrock wall, but it's about this far, which is maybe two inches from the wall. And I painted that with a, with a paint that could handle moisture. I planned that way. But having some kind of a splash, you know, like acrylic would be ideal because it would uh, let you have a spot that things could hit and you can wipe it off with a sponge and your wall looks intact. And if it's clear acrylic, you can actually mount with some really pretty decorative screws. And because it's clear, it'll just stay on the wall and you'll still see the wall, the texture, and it kind of blends in. You'll see it, but you don't really see it, if you know what I mean. Most people won't notice it at all. But you, when you're moving your tank out later, won't have this wrecked wall and you'll be really happy you did it. So thank you very much for the tip, Frank. That was a, a good recommendation to share with the group. I'm looking for the next question. Oh, you know what? I hope the stream's working okay. I uh, didn't plug in. I'm running off of Wi-Fi tonight. I accidentally forgot to run the... I usually run a Ethernet cable directly to the computer so we have a nice solid signal. Brandon, you're absolutely right. We do need to just chill and drink and enjoy our tanks. I mean, that's what you do at night. And uh, I like to do that from time to time. Uh, Di Diacanthus Reef says, if you don't mind me asking, what's the projected recovery time for you after your operation? If and when I get the surgery that I want, it's a four-week recovery time. Uh, what the insurance company wanted me to do was something that would take 12 weeks to recover from that would make my life worse. So I really want option A, and I don't want to do option B. So my plan is to get a new insurance company that will cooperate. Let's see. Uh, Jenny Y says, off topic, but can I have Ketomorpha and Ulva in a refugium in the second chamber of a Fluval Evo 13.5 gallon tank and still have Dragon's Breath in the display tank? Yes, you can do all of that. That sounds great. Good, good question and proceed. Vernon, I'm glad you're able to catch this live stream as well. We, uh, we usually do stick to the Saturday re for a reason. It's a routine. Everyone's used to it. Matter of fact, when I talked to my tank sitter while I was out of town and asked how things were going, he said, everyone wants me to do the live stream since I'm at your house now. <laughs> and I told him, I said, so that's why you want my Wi-Fi password, which was funny. But uh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you know, we, we're used to it. I'm used to it. That's why I come home and I'm like, oh, we should do one tonight because we missed it. So that's why we're doing one now. All right, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Oh, you know what? I didn't talk about that at all. So remember when I said $47 a gallon uh, for your, your nice new setup? That would also be money that would be used to buy an Apex controller. So no matter what size tank you have, I recommend an Apex. And I know someone might think, oh, I just have a 20 gallon or I just have a 29 gallon. That's crazy money. Not really. It's actually pretty awesome, but I understand why you say that. So if you are willing to spend $47 a gallon, it will include the Apex, 
which will not only be good for this tank, but when you decide to upgrade later, you can still use it. And I'm using an Apex to run three tanks in this house, all off of one brain. And I can open up my phone when I'm in Arizona with my dad and check on the tank temperature. I can check my alkalinity level. I mean, I can, I can see what's going on with my system. And having, not only having that ability, which is super sweet, but the fact that it controls things like, um, Charles said here, he's using the Apex to control his heaters to turn them on and off so he didn't have to dial them in as tightly as I was describing. I still prefer to get those heaters set correctly so that way, no matter what device you're using to turn them on and off, if that device were to fail, the heater still can't stay on because it, you've got it dialed in correctly to where it should shut itself off. So, but yes, having an Apex is so useful. It turns things on and off. It notifies you via text, via email. Um, you can even have like a big red light on your tank and the light starts flashing when there's a problem and you like, oh, I wonder what's going on with the tank. Let me open up Apex Fusion. Oh, my dosing pump failed and my, my numbers are dropping. I can make that correction. Or I ran out of a solution and I need to refill something. You know, it's nice to have that kind of control over your tank. So I do recommend it. And uh, I do sell it. <laughs> but I only started selling it recently. I've been using one since 2004. So I don't feel like that's a shill. I, I think I'm just letting you know it is really nice. And when you first get one, you might think, I'm so overwhelmed. All it is is a really expensive thing to turn my heaters on and off. But as you start to learn how to use it more and more, you'll discover it has a lot of features. And we even did a live stream about all the different things you can plug into the Apex. You know, all their own components. I wasn't even talking about like a protein skimmer or a return pump. I literally meant every piece that they make to like even check if your floor gets wet because something's leaking, it can send you an alert. Oh no, there's a flood on the floor. Or the tank got too hot. So it starts turning off the lights. So the tank just goes dark. And that's so your tank won't overheat. You know, I mean, there, it's just, there's a lot of things it can do. So I do recommend it. So thank you for mentioning that, Charles. We have someone here from South Africa who just says good morning. Um, GTA5 vid says, is it okay to use my UV sterilizer to heat my tank? It's nine watts of heat on a small 14 gallon tank. UV sterilizers can heat up a tank, especially if they're oversized and don't match the tank, but it shouldn't be your heater. It's UV sterilizing, that's its job. Now, the fact that it is heating the water might be an additional perk, especially in the winter months, but I wouldn't count on that to do the job. Uh, because you said your tank is uh, 14 gallons, 14 times three is uh, 32. 28, <laughs> 42, uh, 42 watts. So your, your nine watt UV is not powerful enough. Doesn't have enough juice. And don't get a bigger UV, <laughs> just get a heater. I hate doing math on camera. I get super nervous. I would do terrible if I had to do that like in a school, you know, in front of a stage, in front of everyone. Let's see. Oh, you know what? Okay, so I'm going to tell you guys this now. I know we're already an hour into this show, and uh, I should have said this sooner. Something I want you guys to start doing to make it easier for me because there's so much chatter in the chat. I mean, you guys are fine. You're talking. I get it, but I'm looking for the questions. If you can type at Mila's Reef and then your question, that would really help because it'll stand out on my screen. You can even do at Mila's Reef in all caps. You don't have to do the whole question in all caps because then I think you're shouting at me. But I think that would help. So I, I want to start getting you guys to start doing that on our live streams so I can quickly see your question and answer it and hopefully speed these along a little bit better. Like this guy right here at Milo's Reef. I got a better look at the stony pulp that is next to my... Uh, did you spell that right? <laughs> Sarcophyton. And uh, it's some sort of Blastomusa pulp. That's awesome. That's really cool. Blastomusas are beautiful, and if that's what you got, or if it's smaller, it could be a Micromusa, yeah. But yeah, it's always nice to find something cool in your tank that's a hitchhiker that could grow into some really pretty colony. By the way, I was looking at my tank. Oh, I don't have a wire with me. Um, I was looking at an acro in the back of my tank, and oh, it is starting to take off, and the colors are beautiful. 
I'll have to get a good picture for you guys and post it in Club Mule's Reef. It's, it's really nice. And it's really just a disc with a stick with potential. You know, things are happening, but it hasn't, you know, it's no, it's not like a big, nice colony. It's just a, it's a baby that's finally coming to life. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, by the way, last Saturday was water test Saturday. I did all my testing. Here are all of my numbers. So I tested... Oh, it's staying blurry. There we go. So these are all my numbers as of tonight. And uh, everything is pretty good. Phosphates are a little bit up. My nitrates are still hovering around 30. Uh, other than that, tank's doing well. And all the livestock looks healthy and happy. I'm happy about that. And Mina, thank you again for another super chat. I appreciate that. Yeah, you'll uh, you'll learn from this stream, but there's that whole other video that will answer more about the cycling. Let's see. Dot says, do you recommend when placing corals in a tank to put things together like gardens or to spread it out? It depends on the livestock. For example, if you're going to do zoanthids, you might want to have it look like a whole bunch of different colored flowers. And they can be really pretty in groups. And you can plant them all near each other and they'll all intertwine and you have this really cool uh, variety of that specific coral because it can tolerate touching itself. They don't fight. They just kind of, I mean, they're going to run out of room. <laughs> But then they'll start growing outward because there's no room in the middle. It's all packed tight. But a lot of the other corals, like hammer corals, you it, it, it becomes a colony. It's sort of like growing a broccoli. <laughs> it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it needs some space around it. So you can't really group that. So it really comes down to what you're talking about livestock-wise. There was a, a vendor years ago that would sell you a rock, and it had like five corals already growing on it. So you, you just like, doink! instant reef beauty and then you know in the next six months it'll fill in and then eventually you're going to start fragging but it was really kind of cool and i thought man that's great for somebody brand new i mean what a nice way to start your tank it's already glued you don't have to do anything you just enjoy it and you know you can watch it grow so yeah that's kind of cool but normally it's not so much a garden we do kind of spread them out to give them some room to grow and to make sure they're not touching each other because they could fight it depends on what corals we're talking about it's such a vague question and i can't possibly cover all the different species of corals in a live chat it's just there's too many so best is for you to ask hey i've got a leather coral and i've got an acropora can i put them next to each other and we can say no <laughs> but if you said, well, I've got a leather coral and I've got a sinularia and I've got a uh, devil's hand, yes, they can all be near each other because it's all kind of in the leather family. Uh, Brandon says, what's your choice of lighting? I think he's asking me. Uh, I have metal halides above me right now. They're turned off, but that's my light track that's been over the tank now. I built that rack way back in 2011. It's got three metal halide bulbs. I love metal halides. A lot of people are way beyond them, have moved on, think I'm crazy, and they're happy with their LEDs, but I'm happy with my reef. So that's why I don't change what is, you know, being used because it's working. And I've even talked, you know, with Tulio at Reef Bright, and he says, Mark, why would you ever change it? <laughs> Your tank is doing great. What's the point? So I just keep using it. And then the back and the front, I use LED lights. So this is a track right here of blue lighting. Ugh. You can see it's glowing blue. So only one is on right now because the back one's already turned off because it's getting late. And in another 20 minutes, this one's going to turn off. So. Uh, but, you know, other fixtures I like. I like the Radions. I like the Kessel 360X because it's so small. It's just like a hockey puck that hangs over your tank and they have this nice gooseneck arm. 
It just looks really clean. It's controllable with an app from your, your, you know, from your phone, so you can program it that way. Uh, they made a Wi-Fi dongle so you can communicate even easier with it now. That came out last September, so that's a nice one. Uh, I like Radions. I have them on two of my tanks, and then you know the main reef has the metal halides. Oh no. All right, Rocket Family is dealing with a problem. So the tank just hit the one year mark, but the nitrates and the phosphates went out, which I'm assuming means zeroed out. And now it's heading into dinoflagellate time. <clears throat> dinoflagellates are a real pain in the butt. And one of the cures that people have found is really to get nitrate and phosphate back in the tank. So I would, in, what I would do if I had a tank with dinoflagellates is I would siphon out every bit of it I could get out of my tank. Every bit, on the walls, on the sand, on the rock, on power heads, on magnets, on lock line, anything I can remove from the tank and clean off, I would clean it and put it back in. And I would kind of keep doing that to just reduce its population size. I've never had a full blown outbreak. Instead, I had like a weird thing happening a little bit in the refugium. Or I had one coral that was displaying dinoflagellate and I would remove the coral and I would swirl it in a bucket of tank water to get that crap off the coral and put the coral back in the tank. And I was doing that every single day for a few days and hoping the coral would survive me manhandling it. But I never had like a full blown, your tank is wrecked with dinoflagellates like some of you guys are dealing with. Uh, I had made the rec or the suggestion, I guess a year ago when Live Rock Enhance came out that it might help uh, outcompete dinoflagellates with a good beneficial bacteria. Other people are using uh, different methods, different approaches. You have to do some research, but yeah, I'm sorry to hear that your nitrates and phosphates bottomed out. We definitely don't want that in our tanks. Um, MRV said, how many gallons when you start your first tank and... Uh, and it's salt tank or freshwater tank. This is all salt water we're talking about on this channel. And uh, it really comes down to choice. You know, what size tank fits your house? You might think a 40 gallon breeder is perfect and be very happy with it. Others might want a 120 gallon tank. Vern says, Vernon says, do you, uh, do you do acrylic with, with black or dark acrylic? I'm trying to make a refugium in my all-in-one and I have an idea. I wanted to see if it might be something you could do. Uh, yeah, I do. I work with black. I don't have smoked acrylic. It's black. And if, if, if there's something I can make, I can try. I, all my stuff is a quarter inch thick. An all-in-one tank tends to be smaller. A lot of times you guys want something really small and precise. And it's better to use thinner acrylic. And you might want to use somebody like In Tank. That's a brand that does things with a laser cutter. Because those pieces are so small, they cut them with a laser. Uh, versus... You know, the pieces I cut are a little bit bigger on, on Minion, where I'm using a CNC machine to cut out large pieces of acrylic. Dritz, uh, I'm going to talk to you, especially since you wrote in all caps. My snails die after a couple of days. I temp and drip acclimate. Uh, you don't have to do all that. With snails, <clears throat> first of all, did they come in the mail, or did you buy them at the fish store? But then... All you do is check the water from the fish store and see what the salinity was in the bag. And then you can, I mean, you know, if you really want to do an acclimation process, you can just put in a cup of water every seven minutes for about 45 minutes. Usually that consists of when you double the water volume in the bag, it's like what we do with the fish. It's ready to go in. But, uh, if they were mailed to you, you know, if they were shipped, they might have been dry shipped and they're covered in ammonia. And those have to be basically rinsed in tank water and then put directly in the tank. It's pretty quick. You don't have to wait a long time. As long as, the, as, long as they're not like freezing cold out of the bag, you should be good to go. But I'm um, sorry they died after a couple of days. That's pretty quick. <laughs> Cowtown Reefing says, did you notice how bad the fog was this morning? I did, because my car was sweating at the airport uh, in the middle of the night, and I got in, and it was impossible to look out of my windows, and I was trying to get, you know, 
I, just, I actually turned on all those defrosters on the mirrors in the back windows so it, I could actually see. Yeah, it was rough. And then I got some sleep this morning, so I kind of slept through part of it. Let's see. Reef and Dive, thank you so much for the super chat. Buy Spock some treats. I like that. <laughs> and WPK says, I like these live streams at night. It gives me something to watch while I'm at work. What kind of work do you do where you're just sitting around watching YouTube? What a great job. I think we all need that job. Uh, Ian says, or maybe it's Ian. <laughs> I never say it right. Thank you so much for doing these informative chats. I would wanted to know if I should be gravel vacuuming my deep sand bed. The sand bed is four inches deep and my tank is a few years old. I wouldn't touch it. Uh, I really wouldn't. Honestly, I would not. Uh, my tank is six years old and I have not vacuumed the sand bed once. And yeah, I'm dealing with some phosphate and nitrate. But uh, once you start to vacuum a sand bed, you're going to have to keep doing it for the rest of your life. And like the fish store by me, he does it basically every three days. And his tanks always look great, but he vacuums the sand bed every three days. And if you don't, the sand bed starts looking ugly. So what's the cure? Vacuum it again. <laughs> See what I'm saying? You've put yourself on this course now where you have to keep vacuuming forever. So instead, have a good cleanup crew, have Nasaria snails, have fighting conks, have serpent starfish. I don't recommend the sand sifting starfish because it's just too aggressive to your bacteria. But uh, livestock. Hermit crabs, crawling through your sand, helps keep it cleaner. Abe says, will you ever add any more livestock? Well, the tank's kind of full on livestock. If I did anything, I might add more antheus, for example. Or maybe some, some fish of some kind, I don't know what. Something that would be compatible with the rest of my livestock. I've had a lot of these fish for a long time, and you know, when you introduce some new guy causes some chaos. Even with the Peacemaker, there's still a chance that it won't play out well. So it is, you know, it's one of those things you kind of have to feel how the tank will handle it. Um, okay, I think this question was to me, talking about lids. Uh, what are the options for lids for rimmed and rimless aquariums? There's a couple of different ones on the market, and then there's some people that make them professionally. Um, so DD Aqua Solutions, which I always think of them as Deltec, but apparently that's a separate company and I'm incorrect. I think the owner of Deltec owns DD. Maybe that's what it is. But they make a really nice screen that you can basically build to the shape of your tank and cut the fabric and put it together and you have this really nice uh, cover for the tank to keep the fish from jumping out. Other companies may offer screens that are already made for their own tanks, like maybe Innovative Marine offers a screen that fits their tank, for example. Or uh, maybe Red Sea will come up with screen covers that fit their tanks because they make a standard size, you know, so it would fit. Also, there's a company out of uh, Phoenix called Reef Gardens, I believe. No, is that right? I feel like that's right. And they make really nice uh, polycarbonate lids that have the screen built in and they fit right on the top of the tank. And uh, they may even supply the clips you need to like drop it in on a rimless tank. Uh, but if you have a tank like mine that's Eurobrace, it would just sit on top of the Eurobrace. So I guess you would have to Google it. Like, from time to time I have people email me and they say, hey, can you make me a lid for my aquarium? And I always say no, because I don't do that. Derek, thank you very much for that super chat. You like my shirt? Got it at Disney World. It's got all of Mickey on it. <laughs> I had to get it. It was my first time to Disney World. I went uh, last September. All right, I told you guys I was going to do this for 30 minutes, and we've gone a little bit longer, so we need to wrap this up. Kevin says, I had to get rid of my 8-inch Nassau Tang. Had her since she was 4 inches or so in my 180-gallon tank. But even in a tank that's 6 feet long, she needed more room. I really loved that fish. I felt like we had a bond. Yeah, I get it. I mean, Spock has been with me. She's right there. Right there. 
Hi there. <laughs> She's been with me since 2004. I totally understand. Um, and she can move her way across this tank in the blink of an eye. It's crazy. If she's upset, it's like, poof, she's the other end. I'm like, wow, that was fast. So you can just imagine what it would be like if she was in a big tank. Or, you know, in the ocean. But I do like that I've been able to feed her all kinds of treats over all the years and enjoyed her. And she's gone from tank to tank to tank. Uh, George uh, says, do you think I can use Hydra 32, 32? Uh, maybe, uh, 32 lights to light up a 5 foot by 2 foot by 2 foot mixed reef? Yes, uh, I think Hydra 52 would be my choice. I don't know a 32, but maybe there is such a thing. That sounds like a smaller, weaker light to me. I would go with a larger number. Uh, I did notice you said at the end here, you don't want to get the Hydra 64. So, see, I think there's a 52. I think there's a medium. <laughs> Uh, I remember when they had their light, maybe I'm just mixing up the numbers, but I remember when their light came out, it was later they came out with the same name, like Hydra 52 HD, and it was more intense, and it was good for our tanks. But your tank is two feet tall, and you need to penetrate all that water to get down to the corals on the sand bed, or if your tank is bare bottom, down to the bottom glass. So you're going to want a light that has sufficient power, and... Uh, I have a feeling if, if the 32 is a light, I think it's too small. Nolan says, is it easier to keep a larger tank than a smaller one? Okay, so a larger tank is going to cost you more money forever. <laughs> and when things go wrong, it costs a lot of money to fix it. So that part's no fun. But the stability of a bigger tank is so much nicer than it is trying to maintain it in a small tank. The smaller body of water, water parameters shift really quickly and they go out of whack. Uh, they get hot, they get cold, you know, they, they kind of just, they can't just seem, there's more stability in the bigger system. So if you can go with a bigger tank, that is a nice option. It really is. Your life will become easier. But like I said, there are going to be times where it's so darn expensive to fix a problem. You're like, for example, I'm just throwing a, a random thing out into the wind, you know, like, you uh, have really high nitrate, and you have to buy bottle after bottle after bottle of Nopox to bring it down, and you have 500 gallons you're trying to treat. You know, that, that happens, and you, you realize you just spent $300 on Nopox. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. So, on a small tank, you're like, oh yeah, that one $32 bottle, that would have taken care of my, my small tank for a whole year. Well, that's great for you, but it's not great for the guy with the big tank. So, that's something to keep in mind. But I really do like the stability of a bigger system. Uh, Darren asks, are you coming to ReefWorks this year? I don't know. I think I'm invited, <laughs> but I haven't actually confirmed. So that uh, hasn't happened yet. Charles says, do you only drink Crown Royal or do you like other types of whiskeys or bourbons? Not a bourbon guy. Um, my dad likes whiskey. I like Crown Royal, which is a blended whiskey. I like other drinks. I like fruity drinks. <laughs> you know, the, all the ones that they can make in a restaurant that isn't just like poured out of a bottle. Like going to a restaurant and buying a Crown Royal or a Crown and Coke, I can make that at home. And I, I don't want to pay $9 for that in a bar or a restaurant. So if they can make a frozen margarita or a, or something mixed with sangria and other things, you know, I, I will... I will always order that, you know, but I mean, at the house, Shiner Bach is a beer I like, uh, Angry Orchard is a crisp apple flavor that I like, and Crown Roll I like, and then I like iced tea with sugar in it because I'm in Texas. So, uh, and then of course, red wine is also in my arsenal of drinks each month. Let's see. Oh, let's see. Emmanuel was working on something on his tank. He was trying to copy something on my tank. So he says, thank you for helping me with the reverse check valve setup the other day. I did a water test today with my new plumbing on the new build. It stopped the pump, and man, the valve works awesome. Okay, I'm so glad that sentence ended that way. <laughs> I wasn't reading ahead. I was reading it live. And I'm really glad it's working for you. It's been working great for me. I mean, I know this tank is only six years old, but before this tank, there was another tank that had leaked 
that was good for 13 months, and the reverse check valve was on both tanks, and it always broke the siphon instantly. I even used it tonight when I was feeding the fish. You know, if you guys go back earlier into this live stream when I was feeding, I hit the button, stopped the return pump, and five minutes later, or maybe it was 10, uh, the return pump came back on and a bunch of air bubbles blew into the tank. So the reverse check valve works great. It's not like a regular check valve. That's the thing that a lot of people don't know. And on this channel, I have a video called the, you know, the reverse check valve explained or some name like that. And it's how I set up my plumbing to break the siphon instantly and not suck, suck out water. So when my pump is off, the water doesn't just drop down to here or something. It, it stays nice and high the way the tank should be. Uh, CJ says, can you treat a tank with Flux RX while dosing Live Rock Enhance? I wouldn't recommend it. And the reason being is you're, comp again, we're dealing with chemicals and bacterias, and you could create like a super bacteria. And I'm not trying to say like you're going to cause a, a, a crazy virus that kills people, but the chemical interaction could cause chaos. And we don't want chaos in our tank. So I would deal with Flux RX, handle your green hair algae or bryopsis problem or bubble, hair, uh, bubble algae problem, and in three weeks, when it's all done, then you can do a water change if you like, um, get that protein skimmer working again, and then you can use Live Rock Enhance and clean up the rock work and uh, the walls of the tank. It'll be really nice. You'll, you'll like it. But I wouldn't put them in at the same time, no. Let's see. How are we doing? There's still 200 of you guys on here, 202 people right now. And by the way, uh, so apparently some trolls are slipping in and out of this chat tonight. And that's one of the reasons why we do this on Saturdays <laughs> instead of at night. <laughs> when the trolls are sleeping is when we do our streams. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Emmanuel says, with the reborn media in your refugium, do you get a lot of detritus stuck in there? Also, do you siphon it regularly? No, I haven't. I need to. I need to clean it out. But the nice thing is I can just shove it over, and then all the crud that's underneath, I can just pump that out with the attachment that goes on the maxi jet. And I just haven't done any type of that kind of cleaning because my saltwater vat isn't full of salt water yet. I wanted, I want to make a batch of salt water, and then I can start doing my cleaning and have plenty of new water to put in the tank. And that project is on my top five list of things I need to accomplish now. So that's coming soon. I will be very happy on this running because basically I don't have any kind of a security system right now. With the lack of salt water available, if I'm in a pinch, if something goes wrong, I'm going to have to hope the fish store down the street has water for me instead of me having it here at my house in the middle of the night when you know you're going to need it the most. So I have got to get that done. I even talked to my tank setter about hiring him for a day or two to help me with a bunch of projects just because I need to... There's not enough hours in the day. And so paying him to help me would actually <laughs> be worth the money. Manny says, why don't you mount any corals to the back wall of your aquarium? Because the back wall of my aquarium is actually a viewing side and it's really pretty. There's a, the other side of my reef. So you can actually view this tank from this side from that side and from the back side. And then this end you can't because there's a black sheet of acrylic. So there's no point putting any kind of corals on the glass. I don't even like frag racks in tanks. And there's plenty of rock work for the corals to grow on and I like to have nice big viewing windows to enjoy the tank itself. Uh, Bill Paddock says, can I use salt that is clumped in a bucket if I break it up? If you can break it up, yes. If it's hard as stone, take that stone piece and throw it away and use whatever salt is still available that does work. But I don't recommend trying to pound it into submission, literally with like a brick, I mean with a, a brick, with a hammer, trying to smash it into powder again and try, it just never mixes right. And you end up with this weird stuff in the bottom of your bucket. And you might even have weird chemical reactions because part of the salt has already, because moisture got into it, it's already activated, it's already, mixed alkaline calcium together, for example, and it's doing something that's not beneficial to your tank. So I try to make sure I always seal the bags very carefully on brand new bags of salt so no moisture gets in there. I don't put a wet cup in there to scoop. You know, it's 
a dry cup, pour it in the barrel, dry cup, pour it in the barrel. If the cup is still dry, put it back in the container so it's there for next time. Seal the bag, tape it shut so it's, you know, moisture proof. But uh, I've had, occasionally I've had to just take an entire brick of salt. I never even used it. It sat in the garage and it turned into a brick. <laughs> just a ginormous block and I just threw it in the dumpster. Couldn't use it. Charles says, are you going to be attending MACNA in Phoenix? Absolutely. I go every year to MACNA. I've been going to every MACNA since 2002. So this, I guess, is my 18th or 19th one. Uh, Salty Reef Girl says, have you seen where an anemone can be nocturnal? Mine is, and when I run my AI primes at 50%, uh, I'm not sure what's going on. Well, you know, a friend of mine told me many years ago, they're mindless bags of water that do whatever they want. <laughs> so there are times where they'll close up like a ball of socks. There's times when they're open. Um, there's times when they're really stretched out. There's times when they're spawning. Uh, right now, mine is just a big thing, like it looks every day. Kind of looks the same day in and day out. The ones in the anemone cube look a little different. Um, depending on what's going on tonight. They're actually, most of them are retracted down. It's really small. So, uh, you know, it, it is possible that it may be very happy, uh, even late at night when the lights are out and you're, you check on it, you're like, wow, I didn't expect that to be like that. I thought it would be sleeping. <laughs> and sometimes they don't. They really do. They have their own moods. Oh, see, that's the last of the lights. Let's see. Vernon, yes, a mesh screen is a good idea for most tanks to keep fish from jumping out. Uh, JMS says, have we missed the meaty feeding time? Yeah, all the foods went in. Now the fish are just waiting for me to turn off these lights. These lights. Sometimes I'm out here working late at night, you know, on the workstation, and so I keep them up a little past their bedtime. Lunker, welcome back. After 30 years, you're getting back into the hobby. Wow, it is going to be so different from what you did way back then. Uh, Charles asked a question. I've noticed some people are using compression fittings and plugging their probes externally, thus saving room in the sump. They claim this makes the probes more accurate. What are your thoughts on this? I don't know that that makes that much of a difference. A probe is only as good as its calibration. Um, they need to be in a bubble-free environment. Uh, I've had probes just loose in my sump. I've had probes on a probe holder. I've had probes between the baffles. I've had probes just dangling in the tank when the sump was being swapped out. They always did their job. I don't know that having them secured as kind of a, a fancy holder is really going to make that much of a difference <coughs> on accuracy. Neil says, have you looked at the Reef Bot water tester? <coughs> I have. I think it's pretty cool. The... Uh, the machine could actually do like my phosphate and my nitrate tests and then the trident can do the other tests and then all I'm down to doing is salinity because I never believe my salinity probe that's on my apex. Uh, Alex says, what are your thoughts on Ganiopora? Beautiful coral in the old days, very hard to keep alive. Um, I believe the red ones were the easy ones and the green ones are the hard ones. I've actually, in recent years, purchased a small one at a frag swap and it's, or a, you know, some kind of a reef event, and it still didn't make it. But I wasn't using Benner Reef yet, so maybe that would be the cure. There is a jar of food called Ganeo Power, 
Ghani power. Ganyo power. And that one is does it's a specific food just for Ganyapora. And uh, the problem is when you have a big tank like mine and you're trying to feed that one coral, that one certain food kind of blows everywhere. So uh, I haven't tried in a while, but in the old days it was much harder. I think these days it might be getting easier, but it was never a beginner coral. Hey, Branson, what are you doing on here? Dubai. That's awesome. I hung out with him. Uh, Ron says, there's reef aptasia in my sump and refugium. Should I break it down, do a deep cleaning, and restart it with clean macroalgae? I would just try to, I mean, it's up to you. If you want to do a deep cleaning, go for it. If you want to just remove the aptasia that you found down there, you can just scrape them off and remove them. You can siphon them out. Um, however you want to go about it. If it's in your refugium plants, you can pluck them out. <laughs> it's not that hard. They're actually removable, but uh, I guess it just depends how aggressive you want to be on this. But uh, if they're down there, it's okay. It doesn't Just because they're down there doesn't mean they'll end up in your tank. Sometimes you'll find like an overflow box might be full of Aptasia, but there's none in the tank itself. And uh, they're just filter feeding in the, in the overflow box. Uh, High Point Films says, what are your thoughts on a canister filter for a saltwater tank? I would say that's old school, and I'm not saying you can't. And maybe for a fish-only system, it's perfectly well-suited, but for a reef tank, I don't know that that would work for most people. The premise of a canister filter is to use different layers of strata, so floss, carbon, purigen, floss, and you just hook that up once a month and it just builds up with crud over time and then you know once a month you have to change it all out again and that's kind of what I did as a kid for my dad's aquarium but we didn't even have living corals back then we had fish and even then it was a big old pain to clean that thing now they make them nicer now with better valves to where you can like close the lines and leave it hooked up to the tank and just remove the canister itself clean it out reassemble plug it back into place reconnect open the valves again so you don't have water everywhere but uh, most of us, we, I mean, I'm a huge advocate for, or proponent, or whatever the right word is, for protein skimmers, and especially for sumps. So a sump with a protein skimmer, and even better with a refugium that's at least 10% of your tank, that, that's what I recommend, way more than a canister filter. Um, Scott says, what are your, uh, what's your opinion on UV sterilizers on a mixed reef? Would you run them full time or only under specific conditions? You know, some people run UV sterilizers. I've never had to run one, ever. And if I wanted to run one, I would probably run it on a quarantine tank because I'm trying to help new fish overcome whatever plague is affecting them. But I'm not a fish disease guy, so what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've never run a UV on a tank. I've never seen the need. Uh, there was a client in the area that I was helping with their tank, and their tank was running much too hot. And when I looked under the, the aquarium, it was a big tank, like 300 gallons. When I looked under, there was this monster UV. I mean, it was massive. It was probably double the size of what that tank needed, and the tank was running super hot because of it. And so I told them to not run the UV at night, because this beautiful tank was in their bedroom. And so they were hearing, you know, the fans blowing like, woo, trying to cool the tank. And so I said, turn off the UV while you're sleeping so the tank won't be so hot and the fans won't have to come on. And then during the heat of the day, the fans can be on, you won't care because you're not even in the room. But uh, the UV was just too big for that tank. But if you had the right size UV for the tank, the whole conversation changes, right? So then the question is, what benefit is the UV? So a UV is a, a sleeve with a UV emitting bulb on, inside of it. And water flows through this contraption all the time. And nonstop, water should always be moving through it no matter what. That's very important. And with the light on, any bacteria that goes past the UV light will die. So that's good bacteria and bad bacteria because it doesn't know the difference. All it knows is it's killing bacteria. And someone who runs a UV told me in the recent months on this channel that he replaces the bulb twice a year. 
so I guess the bulbs don't last longer than six months. Or maybe, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's a hard, fast rule or if he was just telling me that's the general rule because I just, I don't run one. So I have, I don't have experience with running one. But if you were to run one, is there a certain time of day when you should run it versus not? I think that's going to be arbitrary. If you're just trying to run it part time to kind of like take care of things, sort of a, a version of polishing the water, I could see that. Um, and there was something, oh yeah, and certain products you use in your tank may require you to turn off the UV while the product's in the tank. For example, if you are using Live Rock Enhance, you don't want UV running because you're adding bacteria to the tank. And I would think if you're putting Protibio in your tank or Microbacter 7 or Dr. Tim's or, you know, all these different brands of bacteria, you don't want your UV to kill it. So you would have to disable it while you've added your new product. Dritzkelis says, is there a bacteria I can add to the tank to help break down nitrate cycle without having to remove the fish? I have three green chromis and a black oscillaris. Number one, you have a very small bio load, so that shouldn't be a factor. You could use something as simple as prime in the water to lock up ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, chloramine, chlorine. It's a magical elixir, and you just put in one capful per 50 gallons. So one bottle goes a very long way, and that would help if you're dealing with a tank that just... But you said the nitrate cycle, so I'm not sure if you're talking about you just have nitrates, or if you're saying your tank is still cycling also, but prime is really good to protect your fish if the water's not right. And if your nitrates are just high, if you can do a big water change, like 50%, you'll cut the nitrates in half. So if your nitrates right now are 80, you do a 50% water change. Let's say it's a 10 gallon tank of these four fish. It's 10 gallon tank and you change five gallons, you'll go from 80 ppm to 40 ppm in one water change. And if you do another water change in a couple of days, you'll be down to 20. And if you do another water change in a couple of days, you'll be down to 10. And then it'll probably stay there. Uh, Damika says, do you do international shipping? I would like to get some things from your, from your site. Yes, I do. Uh, what I need you to do is contact me through my website, through Contact Us. And you'll want to give me your postal code and tell me exactly what you want and how many of that item you want, <laughs> because I have to figure out the size of the box, the weight of the box, and uh, the total dollar value of what it is to give you a quote. And then, depending on the country, there may be some kind of a tax or tariff when you receive it. Uh, I've had a few people tell me recently that they got hit with something, um, you know, which I can't control. I literally can't do anything about that. My job is to get in a box and get it on the way to you. What happens in your country, I cannot control, and I apologize in advance. That's just how the world works. Uh, Zach is asking me a question that I'm just I'm just not going to tackle it tonight. It's just <laughs> I want to wrap up the stream and I feel like that's going to be too much. I apologize, but if you'll hit me up on the next live stream, I'll see what I can do to kind of get into this. But um, in the meantime, not using the things you mentioned about the ceramic media. If you go to my website, I have an article about reducing nitrate that you could read over and maybe you'll find some help there. Uh, CJ says, can I place Aiken Lord Hoensis and Recordia mushrooms together? Hmm. Aiken Lords are not aggressive, so I would think they'd be okay near Recordia. I don't know about them rubbing up against each other, you know, that close. But I could see a Recordia patch and Akins all around, and I think they'd kind of harmonize and be okay in the same tank. But I don't know if contact will be an issue. Uh, I've not had a lot of luck with Recordia myself. That's been one of those... <laughs> one of the corals I can't keep long term. I don't know why. I can grow a lot of corals, but there are certain ones that just don't do well in my, in my care. And so I don't buy them often because I kind of feel like it's pointless. But then every once in a while I get a mood. I'm like, oh, let me try one and see what will happen. And I believe there's a Recordia inside the anemone cube underneath the anemone, uh, you know, like under the rock work, and it's completely bleached. It's holding on the rock, but it's getting zero light because of the spot it shows. And it hasn't chosen to move either. And, 
you know, maybe I need to just rip it off the rock and move it in some light and see what it turns into. It might be something pretty, but I see it down there. Uh, wow, I don't know if I can say this name right. Zhao Jun? Do you know if an algae scrubber has the same effect on raising pH like a refugium, or is it a lot less of an impact as it's going to use CO2 from the air instead? I don't know any of that. <laughs> I really don't. Um, I know that running a reverse refugium, running the lights at night while the tank is asleep, can help level out your pH and avoid it from dropping too low. Will a turf scrubber do that? I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Maybe someone's written an article on that, but I don't know the answer. Sorry. Uh, Kevin says, do those LEDs you have put out any par, or is it really for nighttime viewing? So the lights that you just saw at the end of the stream here, those are XHOs. They do put out par, but they're so high up off the water that they're really for looks and to throw blue into the tank. And it makes my corals pop for the last, you know, couple hours of the night. And I also get an hour early in the morning before the metal halides turn on. But they're actually on all day long. You know, they run from 11.30, pretty much to 11.30. <laughs> and uh, the metal halides are on from 1 to 9.30. And, and even that's not eight and a half hours. That's staggered. So I have a video about that on this channel as well. But the, the blue is definitely enhanced. The corals do pop. If I turn off the XHOs while the metal halides are on, I can see the difference. They are that strong that they, they do work well. But measuring PAR on blue lights is always hard because it's not the right spectrum for measuring PAR. Holla at your reef boy. Okay, so I said his name wrong the other day on the stream when I was talking about his channel. Uh, I apologize for that. Thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. And for coming to the live stream, hola! <laughs> I say hola because that's better than holler. <laughs> Let's see. Carson says, I'm thinking of upgrading my tank and trying out the Triton method. Um, learn more about it before you do it. Yeah, if you want to go that route, you're going to need a really big refugium, then the skimmer, then the return zone. You're going to do ICP tests probably four times a year, and you're going to be using their additives based on those ICP tests. So it's kind of a whole new uh, project to embrace. But if, you're, if you've already done something one way and you want to try something new, yeah, by all means. Uh, good luck, and let us know how it goes. Frank says, can you tell me about a book I can buy for someone who wants to start a tank for the first time? Yeah, um, The Con Conscientious Aquarist by Bob Fenner is really good. It's been around a long time. It's been printed twice. You know, there's a second edition. Should be available on Amazon. And it's a really encompassing book. And then there's something called Reef Aquarium, I believe is the name, by Julian Sprung, and there's volumes one, two, and three. And those three books are uh, full of information. And I know books, you know, they're old. <laughs> They've been out 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, but the knowledge that's in them is still excellent. And a lot of the knowledge I have came from those types of books. Uh, there's newer technology out, but there aren't newer books necessarily I'm aware of that would help with the new tech. So... Getting the foundation knowledge from those books would be wise, and then adopting new things that new gear that comes out, you know, by all means, you can you can go that route. All right. Charles says, "What is your bulb replacement schedule on the metal halides?" I have three 250 watt metal halides on a 180 gallon tank back in the day. I was told to replace them every six months, but felt that was excessive. Yeah, that is excessive. Uh, metal halide bulbs should last between nine and 12 months. And if they uh, burn out or just stop running, that's when I replace it. It's, I don't wait for them to die, but I actually have bulbs that will last about two years. So I, uh, I end up only replacing them when something doesn't work, rather than it's time to replace the bulb because it's been this many months. In the old days, when I used other bulbs like 
Uh, there was one I think I liked called Reflux. Love that bulb, but it only looked good for about eight months. And after that, the color shifted and the tank started looking really yellow. And I just had to toss it. I had to get a new bulb. So I liked the bulb. It just didn't last as long as I would have preferred. But the Reef Bright bulbs, man, those things are bulletproof. I've been using them now for, I don't know, maybe 10 years. I love those bulbs. They're great. Prophet says, uh, what are dinoflagellates? Well, it's a type of uh, toxic bacteria in our tanks. And uh, it, when it blooms and, and spreads everywhere, it looks like snot. It's terrible. It's bubbly. It's stringy. And nothing eats it. And anything it touches gets killed by it. It's real bad. It, it's actually something that pulls people right out of the hobby. There are articles written about it. Google is your friend. And uh, Randy Holmes Farley did a huge article about it probably 18 years ago that still is 100% accurate. And I constantly uh, copy and paste that article to people to read. So I'd suggest reading over that. It's long and in-depth, and he'll go into every bit of it and some of the different cures that people have tried to use to beat it, even back then. I'm trying to understand this question. Uh, Sam says, I'm battling green hair algae and bubble algae with a reboot live rocks full of algae. So you reset your tank. Is that what you mean by reboot? Uh, anytime, I mean, okay, so number one, Reflux. Reflux or um, Flux RX, those two products, um, both work to get rid of hair algae and bubble algae. And Flux RX is on my website. And I have it in different sizes for different size tanks. So if you need a small one, you know, get the smallest one. Um, that will definitely get rid of the algae. But the first thing I do whenever there's algae in a tank uh, is I knock out the phosphate first. So I use Phosphate RX. And I put that in the tank. And then three days later, the algae that's in my tank, I can start pulling it off because it's letting go because it's weakened because I stole the phosphate from the water. And uh, if you're rebooting your tank and you're still dealing with algae problems, number one, run the lights less long because you're just feeding it. Number two, phosphate RX to lower the phosphate level in the tank immediately. And the lower it is, the better. And then finally, you can use something like, you can manually remove it like I do, or you can use Flux RX to kill it over a period of about three weeks. And then once it's all gone, you absolutely must put in a cleanup crew immediately to get the last of it so it doesn't grow back. And that's, I think that's the biggest problem most people have. They have algae in their tank. They never have enough snails and hermit crabs in their tanks. And I'm always telling people to get more. So maybe you don't have enough in your, your reboot. <laughs> and you need to get more in there. And, uh, you know, I, I've been telling people this for a long time. And I know people don't do it. But I recommend one critter per gallon when it comes to cleanup crew. So if you have a 100-gallon tank, you need 100 critters. And on my website, millersreef.com slash C-U-C, Clean Up Crew, uh, is an article with the Clean Up Crew critters I recommend. I don't sell them. It's not an article to buy them. It's an article to show you pictures of what they are. Thank you very much, Hala at, Chichi, at Reef Boy. I can barely say that. I hope to meet you one day, Mark. <laughs> You're a walking reef encyclopedia. Thanks for uh, all of your knowledge sharing and being a positive influence in the hobby. I love this hobby. I think it's great. And I love seeing more and more people getting into it. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, C asks about a custom sump. Yes, just let me know what you're looking for. I will address it. I'm a little bit backlogged right now with work, and but no, I can definitely discuss it. But keep in mind, I have some examples of sumps I build on my website, so you can kind of have a general idea of what I build. I literally do not copy other companies. So if you see something you really love from another company, I would say go to that company and ask for them to build your custom size sump. But, you know, if you're kind of working within what I do, then, yeah, I can do it. 
and uh, I do build custom sumps. I pretty much make them every single month. So uh, yeah, reach out to me through my website, through the email button, and we can discuss and we can see what, what you uh, have in mind. And if you have sketches or whatever, you can send those to me as well. Naked Reefer! Thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate it. I always laugh when I think about this person being naked. Oh, thank you, George. I appreciate that. Yeah, see, I never got into the AI line of lighting, and so I didn't learn all the numbers. <laughs> so 32 and 64 are the new version, and 36 and 52 were the ones I knew. Yeah, I remember the 52 really well. I think most of my friends in the local club, which is DFW Mass, had 52s. And then the 52 HD came out, and everyone had to upgrade, and they didn't like that. <laughs> so thanks for uh, explaining that to me. All righty. Uh, Jenny Y says, the Reef Expo in Toronto versus Niagara. Well, I don't know which one is better. Well, uh, I was invited to the Niagara one, so I would recommend that one. And there's going to be several YouTubers there, so that would be a really cool time for you to meet some of the people that you might follow on YouTube. And then Kevin says, Larry's food or Rod's food? I also appreciate the wealth of knowledge. I'm a Rod's food guy. I've been a Rod's food guy forever. I've used some of Larry's food a few different times. You know, I've gone up to the store and bought it. And I just love Rod's food. And my fish do too, so I keep using it. I, you know, when you find something that works, you don't really want to change. And so I haven't changed. Larry sells a ton of food all across the nation and all different brands. He even has uh, PE, whoops, PE Mysis products inside his uh, line. He picked up something like, I think he moves Reef Nutrition now and San Francisco Bay and all these different brands. He's becoming like the every kind of food you can imagine. Uh, so lots of fish stores are carrying a lot of the products that he brings in now because they can all get it from one vendor. So if I'm going to buy fish food from this vendor and fish food from this vendor and fish food from this one all across the nation. It can all come from one source. He's been building quite the empire. But uh, I'm a Raw's food guy. I just have been for a long time. Devin is here. No, I will not try Peach Crown Royal. <laughs> It's not going to happen. Let's see. <laughs> Tyler says, my Montiporas are starting to get too large. It's one of those good problems to have. It's true. It's a great problem to have. Uh, you guys know I've been dosing a lot of magnesium. I also opened up a brand new Elos magnesium test kit recently. Did a picture of it on Instagram and Facebook. <clears throat> where I showed how I'd written the date on the top of the box when I opened it to know a year from now that it's done. And I wanted to emphasize that uh, my new ELOS test kit <clears throat> measures higher in magnesium than my old kit did. And you guys knew I had doubts about the magnesium level in my tank. And I started dosing magnesium every single day. And the new kit was measuring somewhere around 1,500. Today, it was probably, I mean... I was at 1450 and then I added one more drop to the test and kind of got the color I expected to see. So I kind of feel like I'm more around 1400 ppm right now. The Trident says I'm at 1464. So it's relatively close. And if 1450 was right and 1464, man, that's almost dead on. The point is, the tanks had magnesium being added for the last three months. And the Montipores in my tank looks so much better now. My purple grape is back to purple. Uh, there's some sunset right here that is growing with orange polyps again. There's uh, green Monty growing better now. There's green Monty in the anemone cube that's growing really nicely. So magnesium is super important, and uh, I'm so glad that I finally put that in the in the uh, the tank instead of just saying, "Well, the test kit says I don't need it." I just I don't know. I don't know why. My product, my, my tester was saying it was so high because I ran calibrations, but uh, I just kept having doubts. <laughs> so finally I started dosing and the tank just did better. Go figure. Let's see. Big City Beta says, 
Hey, y'all. I like it. <laughs> Marco's great meeting you in Jersey. Awesome. Well, I don't remember you right this second, but maybe it'll come to me later. I always love meeting everybody at these events. It's so fun. And I really do try to remember you guys. I even say, what is your username on YouTube? Or, or what name do you use on Instagram? I'm trying to figure out who's who. Uh, Bill says, do you ever drop the amount of flow in your tank or even reduce the amount of pumps for that flow during the night? Uh, yes, sort of. Uh, it's all programmed. You know, I programmed the Vortex and then I never looked back. And they've been running basically the exact same way for years. And when I look at the actual graphs, if I open up EcoSmart Live and look, I can see, oh yeah, it is running a little slower. But it wasn't like I went from like 100% during the daytime to 30 at night. It's more like 50 at night, 65 in the day, you know, percentage. So it's not a big change. But I do slow it down a little bit, probably because I have an option to do so, not because the reef needs it. <laughs> John, now we're talking. He said, we should all see if Crown will sponsor Mark's videos. Even when I did my old uh, Reef Addicts uh, YouTube interviews, I always made the person I was interviewing drink a shot of Crown. And, you know, it, it just made the interview go better. So it was fun. Uh, Emmanuel says, what is your take on the GHL ion director and KH director? Thinking of migrating to GHL instead of Neptune. I'm a Neptune guy. Uh, I'm not going to disparage GHL. There's people out there that use it. I don't have any personal experience with it at all. I do know that it is very customizable. I don't know how bulletproof it is because I don't know. Um, I do know that if you're migrating from one system to another, you're basically rebuying every piece, every component all over again, because you cannot run a hybrid. <laughs> you know, so I don't really have any advice. Uh, I, there's some people out there that are like, I will never use Neptune ever again. I'm a GHL. I'm like, okay. You know, it's sort of like I had Ford. Now I have Toyota. You know, <laughs> we are, are, our tastes change and we want something different. And uh, I'm very happy with you know, my new choice. Keith said, I made it. Dude, where have you been? We've been at this for two hours <laughs> and you just show up like king of the mountain. Uh, let's see. Branson says, what's the biggest calcium reactor you've come across? My Reef Creation makes some really big calcium reactors. I mean, they are big. <clears throat> Geo's Reef makes big ones too, but the My Reef Creation are like industrial size with like these big, I guess, stainless steel bolts that bolt the darn thing together with a nut and bolt. It's insane. And my big client that I hinted about, you know, last year on YouTube, uh, he's got one that's bolted together like that. Pretty massive. It takes a lot of media to fill up too, which is crazy. Carson says, I'm thinking of investing in an Apex. Are the salinity and ORP probes worth it? What is the ORP probe for anyway? Okay, so salinity probe, it's up to you. Um, I have one in my tank and I have yet to try to calibrate it. I just kind of ignore it. It's just in there doing its thing. The ORP is very important, and it's it's measuring oxygen reduction, ORP, ox, ox, <laughs> I've been drinking. You have to Google what ORP stands for, I'm sorry, I can't think of it right now, but oxygen reduction potential might be correct, and it's basically just a number that measures the amount of oxygen in the tank, so to speak. It's not an O2 sensor, but it's measuring what's happening in the tank, and it's giving you a number on a graph. And the thing is, whatever the number is, it is pretty much every single day. It just rises and falls and kind of does its thing. 
let's just say the magic number like my tank tends to be like right now mine was measuring 342. It was probably 360 and then it's 329 you know it's somewhere in that area. When it drops to 200 for no good reason something's wrong in the tank and that has happened to me in the past where something went really askew and the ORP dropped and I got an alert. So that's the nice thing about it. Now people that dose ozone into their tank they have to measure ORP to make sure it doesn't get too high. And they actually set it up to where if, this is like the code, if ORP is over 425, turn off the uh, ozone, ozonizer. So they don't want to get too high because it can start burning things, but uh, they do need it to trigger on and off using that exact probe. And the ORP probe, as far as I know, comes with all the apexes. So it would come with the uh, the Apex Wi-Fi, which is the big one, or it would come with the Apex Entry Level, which is EL. I think both have the ORP probe. The Salinity probe is the uh, the extra you pay for with a larger uh, Apex unit. But if you said, well, I guess I don't need the Salinity probe now, and you buy the Entry Level version, which is a $500 setup, and you decide you want to add it later, you have to add like a module and that probe and some other probe and then all of a sudden you've actually spent a little bit more than if you just bought it all up front. So you're, you're really coming down to do I want to spend 500 or do I want to spend 800? Other than that, uh, that's about all I got for you tonight. Someone said, I saw that it says you're live, and I don't believe it. I am alive. Jenny Wise says, what salt mix do you use, and what do you dose? Um, salinity is the actual name of the salt I use. It's made by Seachem, and I have a big barrel of it. And it's what I've been using for the last few years. And then dosing-wise... Currently, I'm dosing magnesium and Acropower, and I have a calcium reactor that adds the alkalinity and the calcium. And then I pour in Prodibio on the fifth and on the fifteenth, or the fifth and the twentieth of each month, um, the different vials. And I think that's it. Ryan says, "Will a flame angel be okay in a hundred liter tank?" I'm gonna say no because that's like a 25 gallon aquarium I think and that's a little small for a flame angel. I would like to see that in a 50 gallon or larger. see. <laughs> Macy's daddy says, so glad you have insomnia and that I'm on the West Coast. This is my normal hour of the night, even though I am tired. Anna Kim, thank you very much for the super chat. And she asked the she asked the question, do BTAs group together and get along, or will there be chemical warfare? They do get along. Uh, there may be certain, uh, I don't want to say species, let's say variations of bubble tip anemones that are like very expensive, very unusual, that may not get along with normal bubble tips. And it's not really a, uh, I mean, they're all the same animal, but... I just had this feeling that if you bought like an $1,800 black widow anemone and put it with a $30 rose bubble tip, you may be upset that the $1,800 anemone didn't make it. Just, I have a feeling about that. I'm not 100% sure, but I think I read somewhere something by somebody once where they were talking about how, you know, the super high-end ones don't, <laughs> don't jive well with the rest. And I was like, what? How is that even a thing? You know, I don't know. But mine and my tank, I've had, uh, 
I've got three different species in the anemone cube right now, and they've all been together, and they all touch, intermingle, climb over each other, move away across the tank, no chemical warfare whatsoever. And uh, one of my local hobbyists actually told me he had one that was a different color than I have, and he was offering it to me recently, and I just need to get over there and pick it up, if he still has it. But no, bubble tip and enemies can all get along as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Drop Bear says, it's Tuesday. You must be in Australia. Uh... Tuesday, 5 p.m. I'm watching a live stream. What is happening? It's almost over. Don't worry. <laughs> Let's see. Lunatic Rider says, how's the back doing? Terrible. <laughs> Thought I'd hop on for a bit before hitting the hay. Uh, the neck and back are feeling pretty bad for me tonight. Maybe next live stream. Uh, yeah, it's it's just rotten. Uh, it, nothing's changed. I've been exercising. I've been walking. I've been you know doing what I can, taking pills, and um, trying to keep from getting too grumpy. If that makes sense. But uh, you know, until somebody goes in and alters me internally, I'm just gonna have to keep living with it. We're near the end. I gotta turn this thing off. We've been going too long. I was planning like an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And here we are, two minutes and six, two hours and six minutes in. Um, Adam, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Just caught that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so. That's for Spock. Thank you. And so the the uh, the fish doctor that's going to come here is scheduled for February 10th. And uh, she's going to remove Spock from the tank and measure and weigh and inspect and see if the eye can be helped. And so thank you very much. I appreciate that. That was nice. I, I didn't actually ask for people to contribute to that. So it's even more special that you chose to do that of your own accord. I uh, just felt like Spock deserved some extra attention because she's been with me so long, and I'd like to hopefully help her eye. So, yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, Mike Remington says, What are your recommendations? I'm laughing, but let me finish the sentence. What are your recommendations on how often to do water changes? at 15% once a week, every two weeks, a month. You're asking a guy that never does water changes, so that's why I have to laugh, because you know I feel like I'm not a hypocrite, people. I just don't do them. <laughs> but the general rule is change 25% of your water once a month. So if you want to do it any other way, if you want to do it more frequently, you can, but you don't have to. You can do it once a month. I did two water changes last year, okay? And they weren't even big. They are 55 gallons each time. And, uh, tanks alive <laughs> so and corals are growing and I'm having to cut them so I mean you know I'm not gonna recommend I mean you know it just depends what you're trying to accomplish like some people they do water changes knowing the new salt mix has alkaline calcium magnesium in it so they don't have to dose they change water every single week and they never dose because it's in the mix well that makes sense for them me I have all the stuff hooked up to add all the elements my tank needs so water change is not a necessity. Uh, would it make a difference if I did do water changes? Probably. Would the water clarity be even better? Definitely. Would the corals grow faster? Probably. But do I need corals to grow faster? No. <laughs> I have to bring Dwayne out here from Seattle to cut corals down when they get too big because I don't want to do it. <laughs> so, but no, once the saltwater bat's fixed up, I will get back to doing water changes once a month. But it won't even be 25%. It'll be a little less. Because I'm just going to do what's easy. Whatever's convenient. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> WPK says, I don't think you can do a short live stream anymore, Mark. I don't mind, though. By the way, the fog is moving in again. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised because the storm was coming. So, 
yeah, no, we're, we're kind of hooked on these long streams. I know not everyone's a huge fan of it, but it's, uh, it's popular too. I mean, people like it. What I need to do is release my videos too. I need to just, I need time at the computer. Right now I'm just trying to catch up with all the orders came rolling in in December and now of course January and my backlog is getting better. I got a bunch out before I left town last week and I've got a whole bunch of stuff cut out now to work on this week. I want to get as many orders caught up as possible so that those have been waiting a while. They've been super patient. I really appreciate that. But at the same time, I have to fulfill those because, you know, patience only goes so far. So I'm going to stop the stream here, guys. I hope that you did test your water last weekend. If you did not, you can do it this weekend or you can be like me and do it today and just find out where your tank is because uh, I set myself a personal goal or resolution this year that I'm going to test my water every weekend for the entire year and put the data in the Reef Trace app on my phone so I actually have 52 points of data for the year. I didn't do it last year. I was kind of hit or miss sporadically entering data and I kind of felt like, let me try this year to see a whole bunch of dots. That would make me super happy. And it's just a personal thing, but uh, I want to do it. I want to, <laughs> I want to try to do it. So far, I've got a, uh, I don't know, it's the first month of the year. I've probably got two or three tests in there, and now I'll be adding this one as soon as I get off the stream, and that'll be you know, all of January because we're heading into February next. So other than that, I hope you guys have a great night. Get some rest if it's your daytime. Have a good day, and I will see you guys next Saturday at two o'clock. Bye.